Hey guys, I'm going here tonight with a Mark 14. That is to say, an M14 style weapon, whether it's an M1A, M305, M14, whatever you have, inside of a Sage EBR enhanced battle rifle chassis system. So this is super cool. This is one of the last iterations of this legendary weapon system that was introduced in 1959, phased out in the late 60s, becoming the shortest um, the U.S. rifle system in U.S. history, the shortest serving rifle, yet with the longest overall service history because it just kept sticking around, going through different uh, different aspects of the U.S. military. Really cool. So again, started off in 1959. This iteration came about, you know, around in the early 2000s, and it is uh, still an awesome, still a kick-ass rifle system even to this day. So we're going to talk about the ergonomics. We're going to talk about the controls, how this thing works. The specifications of the firearm, and then again a little bit of that history uh, just to round out your knowledge base on such a cool firearm. Again, this is a popular game gun in movies, in video games, featured in you know PUBG, things like that. So we're just gonna give this guy a good bit of a chat and then we'll we'll carry on. Alright, first things first, let's prove this beauty clear. So to do that, we're gonna rack back our action pop out the magazine here. These are 20 round magazines. I'm in Canada, unfortunately, so these things are limited to comply with our laws up here. There are 10 round version mags available with a full 10 round capacity that we can use. So this gun is a semi-automatic, basically with this chassis system, it's meant to be kind of like a DMR style rifle, designated marksman rifle, really slick. Some of the guns that went into this had enhanced accuracy systems. Typically, there was an 18-inch barrel. Some of the models had a 22-inch barrel. Like the M39, I, th I think, had a 22-inch barrel. For Canada, just to keep this thing nice and non-restricted, we got an 18.6 in this guy here. And this actually is a Norinco M305, because of the many countries, like Taiwan, or like in South America, there's a ton of countries that manufactured um, the M14 firearm. Uh, even, even Norinco in China did. So they're popular in Canada here, because they're honestly a pretty solid quality option to get into this system then you just gotta you know spend on the chassis which is uh ironically way more expensive than even the firearm itself so that's uh that's the way she runs she's a short stroke piston system a cool little short stroke system up here if you guys want to check out my disassembly video where i show you how to take the stock off or the chassis system off i show you how to take the gun apart i'll show you guys can see the chassis system or the piston system sorry in there how she runs it's different from a grand so a Grand is a long stroke. Mini 14 actually is a little bit more like a Grand than the M14 because this actually makes use of a short stroke, which is really cool. So a short stroke uh, for a civilian, like such as myself, we're limited for the most part to semi-automatics, though the chassis system does have a cutout for the full auto selector, which is you would be, be selecting it from there. Uh, so basically that's, that's how you charge the gun, you know, just charge it kind of the same side as an AK. The magazine's rock and lock like an AK. You've got a paddle release like an AK. Um, this gun honestly was developed, I think it started getting in developing in the 1954 and then it was finished in 1959, went into production. So, you know, it was after the AK, so they could have taken some nods from that guy there. Um, the safety is going to be located inside your trigger mechanism, which is, you know, it's somewhat convenient. This is on safe right now. That's on fire. Actually, I'll do a trigger pull for you guys. Really nice trigger on this thing. You can tune these things. Again, these things have been around for so long. A lot of guys still use them in competition shooting. There's competitions just dedicated to M1A rifles or this style of, of rifle. Whether it's a Woodstock or, or a Sage EBR chassis, whatever you got. Um, there's there's lots of guys that are really into shooting these things. And there are accurized models. Like Fulton Armory makes a really high quality forged receiver accurate model. So you guys can check those out. These guns can be made pretty, pretty capable. Though the originals were pretty... Inaccurate. You're talking like three, four MOA guns. Anyways, trigger pull on this one. A little bit of take up. Then just a wall and a crisp break. Uh, really nice. Really nice system. So there's also a bolt hold on the opposite side, this little guy right here. So all you got to do is pull back that charging handle. Press this little button in right there. That's going to hold her back for you. And then again, if you if you got a loaded mag inside, just pull back a little bit, let her rock forward, and that'll be another way to chamber the round. The round being 
308 or 762 by 51. So typically you're gonna have 147 grain all the way up to like a 180 grain. Now let's go through the controls on this chassis here a little bit, because it's definitely adjustable for the user. So you've got, first of all, your, you know, this telescopic stock system is really slick. The US SOCOM did actually want a lot of the stuff. They spec'd a lot of the stuff. They wanted, you know, a chassis system that had, you know, steel rods for adjusting the length of pole. So that's, that's really nice. So you've got a number of different, that's the, uh, see back there, that's the actuator for this thing. It actuates this lever down here. And then there's all these different cutouts in these rails for you guys to select. Then there is also a cheek comb adjustment as well. And that's just this little lever back here. Flip this guy up and then you can just move this section freely. So from super high comb height to all the way flush. So pretty, pretty slick. There are a number of mounts that you can put on here as well that bridge this gap. One of the common ones, the arms mount, threads into this part of the re this receiver right here, extends this optics bridge back here. That way you can get a, you know, a loophole Mark IV. It's a common uh, optic that these things are outfitted with. Get that on here, get, you know, it's, it's pretty slick. Lots of times when I'm shooting this, if you watch my shooting video, link up here. I just ran a red dot right up here and it was awesome, super good time. Sights are pretty slick. There's a, a rotary drum system. You can see that moves, that moves your, your elevation. Moves that little guy right up there. This side on the right is for your windage. And then down here at the front, we've just got a uh, hooded front sight blade that is driftable for windage. I got a muzzle brake on here. Lots of times you'll just see a flash hider. All right guys, and for specs on this thing, again, I mentioned it's got an 18.6 inch barrel, typically outfitted with an 18 or 22 inch. You can get these in a 16 inch as well, like kind of the SOCOM model. You'll see this, the 16 inch versions. Chambered in 308, 762 by 51 NATO. Uh, overall weight, as you see it right here, as configured with an empty mag, is gonna be 11 and a half pounds. Um, overall length, minimum with the stock fully collapsed, gonna be 36 and a half inches. Total uh, fully extended length is 42 and a quarter inch length. So decent amount of adjustment there with that length of pull. Sorry, quick, quick correction, 36 inches, minimum 42 and a quarter overall. Now this Sage chassis has a lot of room for pick rail. Full pick rail up top here. I really like how it's scalloped out, kind of see down it. Also, it's a nice, you know, weight savings measure as well. All the other pick rails, the sections of pick rail rather, are optional. They can be taken off or they can be moved slightly. This guy here, this the sides at three o'clock and nine o'clock. From the inside, you have to take off, basically to take the whole gun out of the chassis in order to move these things around because the access pins or the access uh, screws are on the inside. So you undo those, you can move them over a little bit and this whole bottom rail can be uh, removed as well. It might be able to be moved a little bit. I think mostly you just re remove it though at that point in time or put one of these smaller sections on the bottom. Uh, this hand guard is also optional. You can take this off and it's just pick rail all underneath there. So now just a quick condensed history on this rifle because a guy could talk forever about this thing given it's been around in active use since 1959 yet through its own, its short service life of, you know, eight or nine years being phased out largely by 1968, it still stuck around. It became accurized and was used as a DMR or sniper rifle uh, through a number of different military or a number of different, you know, organizations in the government and the military for, for ages. And then finally, well, I guess let's go back to the beginning. So in, in 1954, you know, you know, shortly after World War II, or I guess in the decade, fo decade following that, the UN was formed, NATO was formed, they decided for some, some universal specs for ammunition, and you know, the 762 by 51 was born, and all the you know, NATO partner countries were supposed to get involved in that. Now, most countries were smart and took the FAL, which was clearly the winner between that and the M14. I might get a little bit of hate for that, but honestly, having handled both, I would have to agree. Like the, F, the, the FAL is a superior, uh, superior firearm. Now, the U.S. also needed to, you know, conform to this standard, but they wanted to have their own homegrown platform, made in America, you know, all that, all that good stuff. And I, I appreciate all that and the patriotism that behind that. But they decided on the M14. They basically went with the classic, you know, battle rifle of the day, you know, full wood stock, no pistol grip. They they went with the external magazine, which was good, this 20 round magazine. 
but largely the other features, they just kind of tried to tweak this great rifle that the Grand was. The problem was World War II was over, we were into a modern era. The Grand was great, the Grand was potentially the Garand, however you want to pronounce it, was potentially the, the best small arm, probably actually was the best small arm um, by a, a wide margin in World War II. However, they should have just left left it lie, left it, left it in peace, and moved on with the FAL. However, they tried to give new life into it through the M14, and, and hence we had that, that rifle. Um, design in 1954, production 1959, used by a ton of countries, other than just the USA. The tooling was passed around, and I mean, again, like I mentioned, even Taiwan was making these guns. So anyways, the service rifle was meant to be effective out to about 500 yards. It was using a 30 cal projectile, traveling at about 2,800 feet per second. So those were kind of the specs on the system as a whole. Now, Springfield was the original designer for, for the, the M14 uh, when, it, when it first debuted in the 50s. And then in 2000, SOCOM wanted a rebirth of the rifle for, for some of their elite units, right? So say GBR submitted this trial. It was, there was a, little, a couple different you know, iterations that this thing went through, but eventually Sage's design won out and they supplied SOCOM, which went on to basically the Navy SEALs in 2004 and the US Coast Guard shortly after that. So a direct quote that I got from somewhere was that the United, Navy, the United States Navy SEALs appreciated the robustness of the system enough to adopt it as a sniper and dedicated marksman rifle, DMR weapon, uh, the latter becoming the heavily modified Mark 14 Mod O, which is this guy, EBR, or Enhanced Battle Rifle. And then even after this thing's deployment, there were a few other iterations, a few small changes. I'm not going to go into details of those because this is probably the most, you know, famous, I suppose. If you guys want to do any more further reading, just check out the M39, some of those, some of those uh, rifles as well. But suffice it to say, it went down as a classic. It looks awesome. It functions super well, even to this day. This chassis really did bring the M14 into the 21st century, and I'm glad they did because I think this is probably the most, in my mind, opportune scenario or application for this firearm to shine. And I'm glad it finally, finally got its day. All right, guys, moving on from this, let's bust out the bonus gun, which is actually gonna appear as the gun of the week, not next week, but two weeks from now. And that is none other than another 30 cal blaster. We've got ourselves a Velmet M76 folder, pretty slick. I'm in Canada, so a quick disclaimer is that this thing is not actually an M76. It's an M78, as you can see right down here, uh, which is totally legal for me up here. Just wearing, it's dressed as an M76. Pretty cool. Again, slick firearm, chambered the same. This thing will take the same rounds. 762 51 308. Super sweet gun. If you want to see more, stick with me for a couple weeks, because this, again, will be the gun of the week in just a couple weeks time. We've got one more gun to go through and then uh, then onto this guy. So that's it for the show tonight. Thanks again for sticking around. It's a Sunday night. I was, uh, this, this video is literally filmed like probably a half an hour before it goes live. Yeah, but it's a Sunday and sometimes I spend my Sundays researching other content. Super interested in nods recently. So nods, thermals, IR, you know, devices, things like that. So I've been spending some time researching that because I want to bring that element to the channel as well soon here. So if you like that stuff, definitely hit the like, subscribe, share, do all the things because they really do help me out. If you like my content, please consider supporting the channel, Patreon. Again, this isn't my job. This is just my passion. I do it because I love it. I love the guns. I love the gear and all the funds that go into the channel that you guys send in. They just get reinvested right back into the content, bringing more gear in to do more Hopefully what I, what I hope you guys consider to be solid content. So that's it for tonight. Thanks a ton, guys. Arm and Gun out.